And here we go, back now for part two for week five, back into the rest of project planning. So we've been talking about a schedule and how it flows and precedence and sequencing and order, right? But we all know project doesn't always go on time. Most projects don't. So we have to talk in terms of leads and lags. So a lag is a delay that you add, a required delay in your schedule. And a lead is accelerating an activity. So lag is an intended delay to an activity, and a lead is accelerating an activity. And there's a good example there on the slide for you to review, also in the uh, book. Now, <clears throat> each activity, each node that we define, right, that goes to another node, remember we're doing uh, PDM, precedence diagramming method, and the form of PDM we're doing is activity on node. These are the nodes right here. So each node has to have a duration. How long is this activity going to take? Let's say six days for this one. Let's say 10 days for this activity, okay? And so we figure out based on how many people work for us, their skill level, their experience, will it take to complete this task? I might be able to do this activity in two days if I had the right staff, but I don't. I have a young staff, inexperienced. I think it's going to take six days. And that is called the duration for each activity. It's that elapsed time that you will be working on the activity before you can move on to the next node. Okay, and it's going to take some effort, right? And effort is in terms of work days normally. Could be work hours if you wanted, and you could use other measures as well, as long as they're consistent. Uh, so duration estimates are often provided as discrete estimates, such as four weeks. Um, a range, a small range, I'll say this here, a small range is considered the best estimate right? If I have a large range, that increases risk. If I have a range of activity from uh, two weeks to eight weeks, that's huge risk. That's a bunch of time. Come on, we can do better than that. But uh, a range of seven to eight weeks uh, is actually very useful because it helps the schedule to stay on task. I don't, you won't see that on any test a range, but it's a good concept to be aware of. Now, talk about risk. A large range is risk. One way to reduce the risk is to do a three-point estimate. And the best three-point estimate is called PERT, Program Evaluation and Review Technique. Basically, you take the optimistic time at plus the pessimistic time of an activity and the most likely time, multiply the most likely by, let me make it a different, the most likely by four and divide it by six. Why by six? Well, because I have six data points on top, one, two, and four here. That's six data points. So we divide by six. We're looking for an average is what we're doing. And so let me give you an example. If I drive to work and on a good day, I get up early. It's a holiday for most companies, so there's uh, not a lot of traffic. I can get to work in 10 minutes. But on a bad day with tons of traffic, it's going to take me 30 minutes to get to work. Uh, and, um, and that's on a bad day. So I have my optimistic time of uh, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I have my pessimistic time of 30 minutes, but on a usual day it takes 15 minutes. So 15 times 4 is 60, plus another 30 is 90, and uh, 10 is 100. 100 divided by 6. My time for driving to work as an activity would be 100 divided by 6. Ooh, public math, that's dangerous. About, uh, we'll say about 15 minutes, okay, is on the average. And that's PERT. It reduces your risk by taking the optimistic most like four times most likely and the pessimistic divided by six. Good technique for doing how long each activity will take. You could also do Monte Carlo simulations. It's just like the gambling place, uh, I think, in southern France. I think it's at hey, Monte Carlo. It's known for gambling and other things like that. So uh, basically, it's a simulation. You take your whole schedule. You take all your constraints you've ever learned. You plug them into this whiz-bang simulator, and it's going to pump out 
all kinds of data, like when your project will end, likely, when, uh, what, where your critical path is on the schedule, etc., etc. It's fabulous, very expensive, and rarely used, but is a fabulous tool if you're running a billion dollar project, a mega project, as uh, PMI calls it. Okay, so these are some examples you can work on your own cute uh, uh, graphic to make a point uh, in the book. Okay, so when I develop the project schedule, it can take various forms. Sometimes it takes the form of a Gantt chart, and that was developed by a guy named Gantt. And what he did was the Gantt puts out the activities, right, how long they'll take, and actually, he connects the dependencies right here with the arrows. So this activity A, activity B, C can't start until A is done, and neither can D start until A is done, right? And so that's a Gantt chart, a good way to lay out. If you use Microsoft Teams, it does a really nice Gantt chart. Also, a tool I like that any of you could purchase. I'm not advocating it, but I, I use it myself. It's called Smart Sheets. It, one word, Smart Sheets. If you go to Smart Sheets and you sign up, you can run. It's Excel on steroids, but it'll run a nice Gantt chart for you for any of your projects. On the schedule, we are always concerned with the critical path. The critical path is something we want to analyze and figure out. The critical path is the earliest that uh, a project can finish, which means it's the longest path through the network the longest path through the network, okay? There is no, no float or slack, extra time on the critical path. Each activity, now, lots of activities could be critical that aren't on the critical path. I'm not saying how important the activities are, but I'm saying is their duration has no float. That's all I'm saying. There's no extra time. If that activity delays, your whole schedule delays. That's the critical path, and it is the longest path in the network, which is also the shortest time that a project can be completed. Okay, so um, we'll do some other examples, and you can go through this in the book. Um, and so what does really critical path really mean? The critical path shows the shortest time that a project can be completed. I think that's the third time now we've been over. It's a very important point. If the critical path delays by a day, your whole project slips a day, right? So you want to monitor that very closely. Uh, if one of the more activities on the critical path takes longer than the planned, the schedule will slip, okay? All right, we've been through that enough. So growing, here's a, an example of growing grass can be on the critical path, right? Again, the critical path isn't the items are critical, it's that they have no float or slack. They've got no extra time built into them, and that's what, from a schedule perspective, makes them critical. There could be other activities not on the critical path that are much more critical from a safety perspective, like handling nuclear material, maybe, okay? So whenever you have a critical path, you know, schedules have issues. You are going to have to make trade-offs. Project managers do that for a living, trade-offs, right? So uh, remember my iron triangle, schedule, scope, and cost. If my schedule slips, it's going to impact my cost for sure and maybe my scope, right? And so I'm going to have to make trade-offs in order to keep that triple constraint balanced. That's uh, one of my goals and a measure of success, okay? Uh, so in order to keep it balanced, if I fall behind, I can do a couple things on the critical path. I can crash or I can fast track. These are called compression techniques. So there are two compression techniques that project management will emphasize. Crashing says that I can take money and add resources to an activity to do them faster, right? Uh, and it, you're actually going to compress the schedule for the least incremental cost. So you'll put money into an activity, but you'll put as little as possible in order to accelerate it back on time. Um, and it, they come with risks, of course, right? Anytime I do something different than planned, it comes with risk. Now, fast tracking is a little different. So fast tracking says I have my processes in order. Remember, finish to start was my relationship. Uh, and this, 
I'm, I've fallen behind, and this takes time, and this takes time. So what I'll do instead is maybe I can do these activities, if they're different teams, in parallel, right, at the same time. There comes some risk, because there was a reason you had them finished to start, but this would accelerate your schedule for sure, okay? All right, critical chain is a variation of critical path scheduling. Uh, not really for this course, but if you're interested in it, there was a gentleman by the name of Eliahu Goldrat, and he did a book called Critical Chain. It's actually a very interesting read. He turns it into a story, scheduling into a story. It's very interesting. Uh, and it's based on the theory of constraints critical chain is. Uh, so the theory of constraints is a management philosophy. Oh, here he is, Eliahu Goldratt. I, all, I recommend picking up his book, The Goal. He also did another one called Critical Chain. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to move past those. We have the media snap, snapshot, which is great, uh, but that's something that you can uh, review. Highly recommended. The book describes it at length. Critical chain talks about buffers and the critical chain. I, uh, I, uh, we're not going to talk about that in this course, critical chain. But if you get Elihu Goldratt's book, uh, you'll really enjoy it. And it gives you another perspective of, it's very much like the critical path method, but we're focusing on that. So here is, um, and so this is a little more about the critical chain. Again, not the focus of this course. This is back to looking at the schedule in a Gantt chart, which we already talked about. And the focus here is still buffers is always about critical chain, okay? Which is really not what we are focused on in this course. It's not used much is why. We, we use critical path method a lot. Uh, now, after schedule management comes the third part of this triple constraint. We have scope, we have schedule, and now we have cost. So by now I've developed my scope baseline, my schedule baseline. What I want to figure out now is my cost baseline, and that will finish my triple constraint, which will give me one measure of my success on the project. So I have to uh, plan cost management. And uh, for those, remember, whenever we're planning, we're always detailing how we're going to run run an activity, uh, run the whole knowledge area. So we will detail how we're going to run all the processes in cost management. Uh, so the cost management plan, this is just a, a an example of things you could have in your cost management plan. I might put what current, if it's a global project, I might put what currency they should report their budget numbers in, right, Ike? I would say when. So I'd say the 28th of the month, because every month has a 28th, you should report your current your budget in dollars uh, at the conversion rate of your country at midnight to U.S. dollars, right? That keeps everybody the same. And then I'm getting consistent information reported back from me by my uh, project team. You know, I do love the what went right. Lessons learned are a super way to experience accelerated learning. So take your time with that. Pause now, read through it, and read the book itself. It uh, explains it in some detail. So just like estimating my schedule durations, I have to estimate my costs, uh, which is, um, and I'll do that for every single activity. There are lots of techniques for doing that. I'm going to pause here because I want to go over these, and we will cover them in the final session for week five. See you in a bit.